were you in the animation industry before you got into Family Dog, and how did you get hired onto the project? Well, uh, I'd been several places before that. Uh, my first professional job right out of CalArts was at Don Bluth Productions, and I I worked on um, a sequel to a video game called Dragon's Lair. Mm-hmm. And, um, so I worked on that, and then in the middle of that, they had some money problems, and they had a big layoff. And then I bounced around back. I uh, was it was it was stressful. I mean, I was a young guy. I was oh, probably yeah. like eighteen or nineteen years old or something like that. And I had left school to go to work with Bluth. And then, so I was kind of going back. I had to go back doing big head caricatures at Magic Mountain Universal just to make a living. And I worked in Saturday morning cartoons, working on a bunch of crap. And I worked on, <laughs> you know. Um, I worked on the Care Bear movie. You know, it was just a lot of just bopping around and trying to, to stay afloat because the industry at that time was kind of on shaky ground, even at Disney. You know, mm-hmm. that's what my real goal was to work at Disney. And um, but things were kind of going through some changes there. Um, what with uh, is Black Cauldron not having done well mm-hmm. and. They had some good things in production, like The Great Mouse Detective, which was originally called Basil of Baker Street. Mm-hmm. And, and then, then, then the whole company was taken over by, you know, there was a Roy Disney Jr. had, you know, gotten the Michael Eisner and Jeffrey Katzenberg in there to take over the film division. So mm-hmm. when they came in, it wasn't sure, there wasn't, it wasn't clear whether there was going to be an animation department anymore, but Roy Disney Jr. kind of saved that. So to try to get back to your answer. Um, Eventually I was hired at Disney and I worked, um, there was one of the younger animators, well, he was a director, his name was Daryl Van Sitters. Oh yeah, I know him. Uh, You know, Daryl. So Daryl, Daryl was heading up a special projects unit that was more or less there to kind of market the older characters, you know, to younger Mm -hmm. audience. And so he had a project that um, he was assigned to called Sport Goofy. It was a half hour featurette. Mm -hmm. So I got hired to be a directing animator on that. And and then we were slated to go on to Roger Rabbit because it was Daryl who who several years prior to that um, had got Disney to buy the rights to the book and he had Robert Zemeckis interested in it. And he had a small unit of people that were, um, you know, doing animation tests and uh, all that kind of stuff, design. Mm-hmm. And so we were kind of in line to do that once once Zemeckis' schedule was was cleared up because he at at the time he was originally going to be involved with it. Um, he was still kind of an upcoming director, but um, he'd done a couple of things, came back, and then the other other films that he'd done were massive hits like Back to the Future and, and mm-hmm. Romance of the Stone. And so by the time we were gonna go on to that, behind the scenes, um, he wanted to do this Roger Rabbit film, but he wanted to do it kind of, he wanted to do it with Richard Williams, he wanted to do it with Spielberg. And now that there was new management at Disney, um, they had to figure out a way to, to either get it out of Disney's hands, get by the rights, you know, so they could just go off and do it. And so they inquired about that. And Disney was like, wait a minute, what do we, what do we own? Cause Katzenberg and those guys didn't know anything about this project. Mm-hmm. And they just said, Hey, well, um, you know, we, we want to do this film and you guys have the rights to it. And so then it became a co-venture. And so then it was kind of, then, then it was a big problem because, you know, it was revealed that, that, um, Robert Zemeckis wanted to use Richard Williams studio instead because they were going to shoot it in London and they, for whatever right. reason, wanted to use Richard Williams. So our unit was shut down and then I was moved over to feature animation where I wanted to be mm-hmm. and help them finish Great Mouse Detective. But there was still a lot of uncertainty because Katzenberg thought animation was too expensive and, and it was only Roy Disney who convince them that look you know animation drives everything it's you know it's the impetus for the rides at the parks at all the all the merchandise etc and so Mm -hmm. 
Oliver and Company was the only project that was in development at that time and after Great Mouse Detective. So there was a big layoff after Great Mouse Detective and I had finally gotten into the an feature animation, but then was laid off after several months helping out finish that Great Mouse Detective film. And so it was around that time that I met Brad and um, I can't even remember how I met him. I might have I might have met him briefly after my second year of Cal Arts. Yeah, he um, was he was at Disney. He, I think he was at Disney at the time. No, well, I don't think so because he 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 left um, Disney like like around Fox and the Hound era. Oh yeah, that's right. So so um, anyhow, I can't remember how we met, but somehow we got reconnected because he had this project, Family Dog, that he wanted to do. And he was already at Universal um, as a writer and he was trying to get into live action. So he co-wrote this movie called Batteries Not Included. And he knew a lot of people at Universal. And somehow he, he was able to meet Spielberg. <clears throat> and as you know, Spielberg had this anthology show called Amazing Stories. Mm -hmm. And Brad was, I think, had co-wrote one of those episodes and even had like a bit part as an actor in it. Mm -hmm. and um, somehow was trying to angle to do an animated episode. And so I'm not sure exactly how or when Brad came up with the concept of Family Dog. I think it was a while back when he was still at Disney because when he was at Disney, as you probably know, because you're a fan of all this stuff, yeah. he, was, he was in the same Cal Arts class as Tim Burton. Mm -hmm. And Tim Burton was at Disney at the same time Brad was there. And Tim was being sort of um, been given some opportunities by one of the younger producers, a guy named Tom Wilhite at the time. And mm -hmm. Tim got his first chance to do like he did um, Vincent, which was a great stop motion. Oh yeah. I heard of that. Animated thing that Tom Wilhite produced. And then he got a chance to do a half hour live action film called Frankenweenie. And, mm -hmm. and so, so Brad was always an admirer of Tim's design style. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the line, Tim drew a drawing of the dog, and it was just like a throwaway drawing. I don't know, you know, how that came about or something. And Brad thought, oh, that's such a great design. It's such a unique looking thing, and no one's ever done anything in this style. And Brad was always trying to push to animation to do more than just kind of kitty films and stuff. Mm -hmm. So he came up with this idea of doing more of an adult humor. Um, more contemporary uh, story, you know, called Family Dog. And so he had, he hired Tim to story. If you remember how, you know, the, the, ep, the amazing stories episode goes, there's actually three separate stories. Yeah. It's like three separate acts of a full, yeah. of like a full episode of a television show. That's right. So, so he had hired Tim to just do that first one as a short because this is the years before, fam, you know, the amazing stories. And so that first one, when the, all the characters are introduced and, um, it, and it feels more like a complete short, you know, the dog is yeah. kicked out of the house and all that. That was completely boarded by Tim Burton. Mm -hmm. So I met Brad and he says, hey, I convinced Steven Spielberg to let me do this amazing stories episode. I, I remember seeing your short film you know, at Cal Arts, and I'd, I'd love to hire you, and, and um, you know, you can help me storyboard. I have ideas, I got to fill this out, because this first one's only, you know, X amount of minutes, and we got to fill out a whole half hour, so how would you like to help me storyboard the next two, and then you can be an animator, and I said, great, sounds good, it was perfect timing for me, because I just got laid off from Disney. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. So when would this have happened? Like approximately what date or like year or something? God, uh, well, when did it come out? It was, uh, it was in 87. So gosh, I don't know, somewhere, I, I would say maybe roughly a year before that, maybe a year and a half, yeah. something like that. I don't know. That sounds realistic. I'd have to look back, but it was like, Whenever the production ended on Great Mouse Detective, I would say so. I, you know, that could have been 85, 86, something like that. I don't, I don't really, really call the exact dates, but in any event, um, so somehow we, you know, so then Brad and I became fast friends because Brad and I were super huge Disney animation geeks. 
Oh yeah. And as you know, Brad, you know, he had trained with Milk Hall and mm -hmm. I had trained with, with Eric Larson and we knew, you know, we just loved the Disney films and all those animators. And that was our big, you know, bonding of, you know, friendship bond was all over that stuff. Yeah. And we both love movies. So we were both super into movies and Brad, Brad always, you know, he, he studied all these great directors and writers. And so we hung out a lot. We go to the movies, <laughs> talk movies and all that. And so we got onto this, got on this project and I helped board the next two things that he wrote. And, um, and then he started building the team and uh, you know he had Chris Buck, who his who was his directing at senior directing animator. I think I might have gotten a supervising director, animation. You have the credit of principal animator, I okay. believe. Okay. Well, Chris might have got a higher one up. He was more experienced than I was, and he'd been in the business a while. Yeah. Longer, but and and and, and, and I worked with Chris incidentally on the Sport Goofy film uh, project. Oh, that's interesting. Him. Yeah, so we were both directing animators on that, along with Ed Gombert, who is a genius story guy, super funny guy. Yeah. Um, and anyhow, so Chris and I, I think we were, Chris and I, and um, I think Daryl Rooney, who it was a, is a great layout guy and overall storyboard artist guy. I kind of just, I'm vaguely remembering this as the team was building. And so yeah. Brad, Brad, um, had rented out this uh, this kind of uh, loft, artist loft in downtown Los Angeles on Traction Avenue on Fourth Street. Not the greatest neighborhood in the world. Yeah, and they didn't have any air conditioning. And <laughs> oh no, it was like you know, we, and we were making this in the summer in LA, so it was Jeez. it was like a you know pressure cooker in there. It was so hot, you know, and so eventually. That, that big open space started filling up with animators. Duncan Marjorie Banks was a fantastic animator. Oh, yeah. On it. I, and I, I and love he his He eventually work. became a really great animator at Disney. Somehow Brad and him had crossed paths. And, you know, and I, so I, I hadn't, I didn't know anything about Duncan until, until he came on. But Brad was like, oh, we got Duncan. He's amazing, blah, blah, blah. And of course he was. And we had Tony Ficilli, who was also awesome. You probably know Tony. Tony designed all the characters of the Incredibles. Um, Sue Croyer, who's the wonderful, uh, you know, animator and person and, and uh, just a hilarious lady who was, um, was good friends with, with Brad from Disney. She was, in, you know, and an animator at Disney when Brad was there too. So she was on the show. Kirk Wise, who was a roommate of mine, he wound up directing Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Other things at Disney. He was my roommate, one of my, or not, not roommate, but a, oh yeah, actually we were roommates at, we rented a house at one point uh, together with Rob Minkoff and some other people. So Kirk was on the show as an animator mm -hmm. and we had Ralph Eggleston, God rest his soul. A yeah. Good I, just passed away. Yeah. It's really sad. Yeah. So Ralph was on it and, uh, Gosh, who else? I'm there was Mark Kausler. He was freelancing. Mark Kausler was freelancing. I think Randy Cartwright was freelancing on it. There was he also was... Greg Vanzo. Greg Vanzo, I think, was yeah, Vanzo was on it. There's a lot of people just freelancing, but in-house, those are the people I mentioned that I, I seem to recall all being under that roof, you know? Yeah. And so Brad was in one section of the, you know, it was kind of a, a big open space and it was kind of an L shape. And Brad had his flatbed editor there and then across the way had you know like a pencil test machine and you could just hear everybody talking and stuff and at first it was a little <laughs> rough just getting adjusted in there because at a certain time of the day there were no blinds it'd be hot and so you'd be animating and then at a certain time of the day all of a sudden the intense heat would get on your drawing board and you'd just be fried you know you'd you're, yeah. you're just Getting the sweat all over the drawings. So we take the storyboards and we block the windows and stuff. And but um, That's you know, great. we just had a lot of laughs. It was a great. It was one of the funnest things I've ever worked on, and and something I was really proud of because I I felt like I had a lot to, to you know to do with, with at least you know the the other other sections that got boarded, and and a lot of the animation. Well, not a lot. I mean, I we did as much as we could. It's like they had a lot of people. We had to crank it out fast. It's not like we had the biggest budget in the world, but 
Um, I just also remember something that stood out um, kind of as we were closing in on finishing the animation. I remember Brad invited us, a small group of us out to Burbank at one of the editorial places where they were processing the film and or starting to do so I can't remember if it was a, a film processing place or a, a sound place mm -hmm. we saw kind of an early screening of just the very first section of it where they were starting to throw in some rough sound effects mm -hmm. and uh scratch music and they had the real actual dialogue in and we watched maybe you know I don't know it was probably just a couple minutes of the first thing but it was just great because we'd been seeing the animation. Everyone was getting excited about just seeing people's pencil tests and stuff. But then when we saw the story coming together in Brad's direction, it was like, oh yeah, we're in good hands here. Cause it was, it was working, you know, the, yeah. the entertainment and the timing, the, you know, the, the cinematic stuff and all things that were getting plus through sound and all these other elements that Brad had in his head that, you know, you can see it on the boards, but when you, when you put all these things together, you just go, okay, this guy knows what the hell he's doing, you know? Yes. I, I can really imagine that must've been an, a wonderful feeling like, see, like working these hot, these hot hours with the sun beating down on you, getting sweat all over your drawings. And then once you see it starting to come together, it's like, wow, we're actually able to do this. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I never doubted Brad, but it was just cool to see, you know, when someone has a vision for something and mm -hmm. you can read a script and you can, you know, when something's working or not, and you can, uh, you had interpreted in your head. And even when you see the production as it comes along, as the artwork shapes up and the animation color and all that stuff, you, you get more and more a uh, sense of what it's going to be. But then when it's finally put together with, all the elements that's what's really great when you can tell that you, you know the timing and the jokes and how things are staged and cut and yeah. all those things then you go okay this this you know you get the full intent of what he had in mind you know yeah and speaking of which i was actually wondering how brad worked as a director because i was wondering if he sort of gave you animators free reign over everything like the posing and timing or did he pre-plan some of that well he pretty much let us go i mean you know he at least with me and i think with most everyone else i think it depended on the skill level i think he um you know we like we would just get the shots and we would interpret. He just pretty much let us go. Mm -hmm. There'd be only a couple times where, excuse me, when I first, I, I animated mostly the stuff in the, in the first episode where I did shots of the dog, the chase stuff of the dog in the stairway and Billy. And oh yeah. That's, that's couple. wonderful stuff. Oh, thanks. And, and then I, um, I jumped around a bit and then and I did um I did Buffy the little girl when he gets she, the dog dresses her up. Yeah. Where's Mary Ann? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So um, you know, there was only one time where I think he and I learned a lot from him in in this moment too, because oh, of course Brad, you know, you you know, as a young animator, you're influenced by what you were inspired by, right? So I mm -hmm. You know, we talked about, I don't can't remember the scene, but it was some some dialogue scene with her. And I I kind of showed him the thumbnails of what I was going to do before I got into it, you know. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't that it was bad. It probably would have worked okay the way I had done it. Mm -hmm. But he he corrected. He said, no, I don't want it to do that. You know, I said, well, this is kind of how I did. I acted out for him. He goes, no, but I don't want that. And that seems, it it seems like, like how old animation would be or whatever. And I want these, want the very specific thing. And I don't, again, I can't remember the specific thing, but he did, he wanted something different. And then I realized, oh, okay, this can be interpreted differently and in a different way that, that was less animation-y, if that makes any sense, you know? Mm -hmm. you're like younger, less you're, overacted and stuff like that. Yeah, or, or I guess it was less, yeah, I suppose, or just more, uh, less, less, um, I guess, less broad or like, 
mm-hmm. exaggerated in a sense like like musical theater would be you know there's right. a oddness and sort of vaudevillian way of doing not that she's a vaudeville character but you know what i mean there's something mm-hmm. a little bit more manufactured or something or artificial yeah. about performance and he you know he was brad was trying to do some animation himself on the film and i, I think he only got a chance at the time to do one scene which is a great scene and it's just a close-up of billy where he goes he's wasn't on the carpet dad and he does this little eye shift oh that's brad that's brad's animation wow and, and so you just go oh i you know because he's brad's a very good actor mm-hmm. and he was almost considering wanting to be an actor when he was younger and stuff so he was trying to push animation into you know he just wanted to get a real just a believable thing based on that character and so once i saw that him doing that and him talking to me, I, I understood what he wanted and so i redid it and you know, I, a lot of times I go over other people's animation too. Stuff would come in from freelancers that weren't, you know, thought out well or drawn mm-hmm. properly. And, and so I'd, I'd go over the drawings like a directing animator and, and Chris Buck would do that a lot. I'm sure mm-hmm. some of the other more experienced people were doing that too. Um, so, yeah, you know. Yeah, and I was actually wondering, is, well, not wondering, um, something I noticed about fam- the animation in Family Dog is that it in the 80s, it's kind of a predecessor. The type of animation is a predecessor to a lot of 90s animation. You know, it's the classically trained look where there's a lot more slow ins and slow outs. There's a lot mm-hmm. more drag and overlap. It's a lot more Disney-like. If yeah. you get what I mean? I do, yeah. And yeah, slight... I mean, the thing is, what you have you have to realize. I mean, a Brad was a Disney animator. I was a Disney animator, and all the people that were animating on it were either Disney animators or wanted to be one. So, mm-hmm. you know, they were learning and cutting their teeth on some of these things and and trying to apply all those principles that were passed down by Frank Thomas and Ali Johnston in their books, and and just that's what we all loved and wanted to do. So. We were trying to do full animation, even though the, the design style was Tim Burton, you know, mm-hmm. which was different, you know, it was a different look and the whole vibe of the show was different, you know, it was more contemporary and, and a little more edgier, you know. Yeah, and actually a slight tangent, do you happen to remember or happen to remember what scenes Greg Banzo animated on the show? Because... He, I don't. I'm sorry. It's so long ago. And and even if even if this, let's say we I just come fresh off of it right now, I probably wouldn't have known just because of everybody's just getting stuff handed out, and it's like one big machine train moving. You know. It's, yeah. It's, you know, that's all right. Sorry, but no I know problem. Greg. I've I I go way back with Greg. I haven't seen him in a long time, but yeah, Greg's a Greg Banzel's a great guy. Yeah. I, I'd really love to interview him someday. Actually, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I don't know if you know Thad Komarowski. He wrote that Ren and Stimpy book. I know of him, and we've chatted now and again via FaceTime, but not in a long time. I don't know him personally. I've never met him personally. But yeah. I know he's a big cartoon aficionado guy. Yeah, well, he said he told me he tried to interview Greg Vanzo back when he was doing research for the Ren and Stimpy book. And he couldn't get through the management at Rough Draft for some reason. So oh. that was kind of a bummer that he couldn't get any information out of him. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, so I guess another question would be, do you happen to, like, I guess you kind of already answered this, but what was the studio environment like when you were working on that? Oh, it was a blast because, you know, animators in general are pretty funny people and they're pretty mm-hmm. smart. And so we all got along well together, you know, really well. And we all have remained, most of us have remained very good friends since then, even though everyone's off doing their thing, that was kind of a touchstone for a lot of us. And we all liked each other and we all liked Brad and we all liked the show. And, and so we would all go out to lunch together. And even though it was kind of a, kind of a scary area at the time, um, because there's just a lot of bums laying around and homeless people and needles on the ground and 
<laughs> you know, dog and human feces, you know, on the, on the, we as we walk to walk to uh, our lunch places. We had, in fact, there was this one guy. It was a homeless guy. He was pretty you know, friendly. I mean, we he he looked. Somebody just said, "Oh, he looks like Poop Deck Pappy from." <laughs> that was our nickname for him, and we'd always be friendly to Poop Deck Pappy. He was always happy to see us out there as we That's walked sweet. to lunch, you know. And we'd hit all. It was kind of the artist district in L.A. around Fourth Street, so there were a lot of really good restaurants around there, and there's kind of an artsy scene there. But it was it was um, cheap rent and kind of dangerous around there. Mm -hmm. But we had a blast. I mean, I mean, it was all I could say it was we worked hard, but it didn't feel like work. You know, we're just we knew we had deadlines and we had to, we had to get the work out. But we laughed a lot along the way. People were doing caricatures of each other all the time. And, you know, and Brad would join in on that stuff, too. And so, they, you know, people would put caricatures on the wall, of people or jokes or mm -hmm. you know, it's just fun. Every animators by and large, are just fun, smart people, you know, and yeah, you know, I they're great. So they're still my friends today, you know. Yeah, that's, that's great. And uh, I guess looking back, what are you proudest of on Family Dog? And is there anything you think you'd go back and do differently if you had the chance? Oh, gosh, let me think about that. Uh, what am I most proud of? Well, uh, I don't know. I guess maybe just, um, I mean, I boarded a lot. I seem to recall reporting a lot, especially of that, the, 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 the second tour, at least the last chunk with the burglar guys. And I, I, mm -hmm. I boarded a lot of stuff. I staged a lot of that stuff in the boards and Brad used it. Some wow. of my gags, you know, are in there because there was it was non-scripted. So Brad would say, hey, I got an idea for this thing. And so he'd 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 be writing certain things on his own. And but he'd give me the gist and I'd start boarding stuff. And then he would, you know, he had an idea of where the thing was going to go and what the what the villains were going to say and where how it was all going to tie up. But I just remember that being kind of a, a organic thing back and forth and so a lot of my staging and my some some jokes wound up in it you know and uh that's great i'm happy of that you know because that's you know part of the filmmaking process right mm -hmm. and you know i'm fairly proud of my animation you know I, when i the only thing that i wished i had um oh, hold on someone's pinging me right now um i'll, I'll get back to them uh uh what was I saying? I guess uh, if I could do anything differently now on it, when sometimes when I look back on the scenes, uh, depending on what it was, like like I think some of the Buffy stuff, mm -hmm. for whatever reason, I interpreted her design uh, based on these model sheets. I kind of drew her a little. Some scenes look dimensional. Some things look a little too flat and two D. And I wish I would have, uh, sorry, hold on, I'm getting, I'm on a thread with Kirk Wise and a couple other people right now. We're, we're getting together a couple mm -hmm. days. So they're, oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, uh, you would draw uh, Buffy dimensionally. I would just draw it more dimensionally. And I think when I look at some of the, the close ups, they go a little flat for my taste. And I would have tried to got more volume and, you know, stuff like that but not not i'm i'm not too hung up i don't i don't at the same time i don't look anything and go oh, i'm embarrassed or anything you know what i mean yeah so um i mean we're, we're we're still pretty young and we're still learning and and uh but i you know stuff worked and it, it delivered delivered the job you know so yeah well thank you very much thank you so much for these great stories i actually learned a whole lot about the production of this of this yeah. great film well you're um, welcome let me can i ask you something sure how did you even know about family dog i mean because you're a young person i mean where where would you know about this and even see it you know well i learned about it through youtube through like videos on youtube and i actually found like family dog was on amazon prime so mm -hmm. i bought it i bought it and i 
like watched it and I thought it was really great. Like I'd heard all these things about it through inter various interviews and stuff. And I was like, well, I got to see this thing for myself. And when I saw it, I was kind of blown away. It's like, wow, this is really kind of ahead of its time for 1987. Yeah. Well, thanks. I mean, it was, it was a lot of fun. I wish it would have lasted. I mean, I'll I'll tell you one more story if you if you have a little bit of time, and then I got sure, I going. have I have some time. So you may or may not know this based on your research if you're a fan of this, but um, you know, after that was done, you know, Brad had ambitions to do a feature, but he had he had some other movie in mind that he wanted to do called The Spirit, based on the Will Eisner mm -hmm. comic, right? So he was trying to get that going. He had some other things going too. And in fact, he might have even had Incredibles in his mind way back when that at that time. I do remember him not long after Family Dog talking to me about The Incredibles, right? So oh, wow. several movies in his head that he wanted to do. But in any event, when that was done, um, Spielberg liked it so much that he wanted to do more with it. And Brad said, well, you know, uh, and Spielberg wanted to do a series, a TV series. And Brad was like, ah, let's do a movie instead because oh, wow. a movie would be, you know, to do this quality of animation and the writing, you know, I want to, let's do a feature with it. And that's, that way we can retain the quality of the writing and the animation, the look and everything. And so Spielberg kind of went along with that at first. And so he gave him some money, I guess, to, to just write it. And Brad, I guess, still had an office at Universal. So he he had a big old board where he had all his writing cards mm. he had mapped out the whole story for a family dog feature. Wow. And so um, he'd have occasional meetings with Spielberg, a bit, but eventually Spielberg, when he got the pitch, he didn't like it. And they, oh, the reason why he didn't like it was Brad again was this, and this is all prior to the Simpsons, right? And right. Prior to family dog and everything. So Brad was trying to push the stuff into more kind of contemporary and adult humor you know i thought animation could be much broader than just for kitties you know yeah so his storyline which was pretty pretty fun i think it would have been really good yeah he had a story where the dad is going through the, a midlife crisis right <laughs> so That's he's, hilarious. Booted out, he's booted out of the house and and uh because i think he's having an affair or something or he has a crush oh, on the woman right <laughs> And then meanwhile, the dog is runs away from home because of all the chaos in the house. And somehow the dog winds up in Hollywood and he becomes a big movie star in Hollywood. Yeah, like kind of like he becomes a star through the dog gang. Yeah, right. And so so he becomes a star, and there's that plot line turned into like a you know, a rags to riches to rags story where <laughs> Hollywood isn't all what it's cracked up to be eventually after all his fame and riches that starts to fall apart for him and he's winds up on the streets and destitute and so does the father through whatever he goes through he winds up you know getting into some trouble just being on his own he's yearning to go back home and so somehow they all wind up back at home and there's a happy ending and and everything is right in the world again and so I guess he pitched this, you know, it was good. I mean, I remember Brad pitching it to me and was like, oh, this is going to be great, you know? Yeah. And, but Spielberg, I guess, was going through his own divorce with Amy Irving and he he just didn't get it. He's like, I don't want to do a movie about divorce and like midlife crisis. This is supposed to be a family yeah, thing. Like, I don't want to do that. That's me right now. <laughs> exactly. Right. So, <laughs> so they kind of got into it and, uh, and then, they were still offering him to do a series and Brad was like kept pleading with them. Look, you know, you, you can't, this can't, we can't, uh, I can't write all these episodes and retain the characters and the humor and the, the writing that I want at this pace. And we're never going to get the animation that look the same way too, because it'll all have to be farmed out overseas. So he ended up passing on it. And then Universal decided to keep going forward with it anyway. And then it was a little funky because they started giving Tim Burton more credit 
than was deserved. Even though Tim had designed the characters, right. he, he wasn't really responsible for the writing and direction of that. That was all Brad, right? Mm -hmm. So they went ahead and did this thing anyway. And um, Brad was super depressed about it because he kind of had a falling out with Spielberg at that time, which had since been patched up. But at the yeah. time, it was like really tough on Brad because they were going to do it anyway. It was his baby. And then like a year or so later, you know, the irony is that the Universal called him back and they were like begging him to take a look at a screening of the first two episodes because they had the air relatively soon. And they said, oh, my God, this is not working. Brad, you, can you please come in here and consult and see if there's any way we can save these? And so Brad went and saw these two other episodes and I'd never seen them to this day, but, he, you know, they weren't. They weren't up to snuff, apparently, and it was just bizarre seeing him. And, and, and the lights came up, and they said, "Well, what can we do?" What you know? And he says, "It's too late. You know, this is all in the writing and the interpretation of the characters. It's not the animation. You know, it's like the the humor and the storylines aren't working because it's not interpreted properly. You know, and it, it didn't come from him. Yeah. So he couldn't do anything to help him. You know, as far as I know, and and uh, they went ahead and. I think they did one full season and then it was canned after that. So, yeah. Yeah. The family dog TV show was kind of, is kind of unanimously considered by like animation fans, kind of a disaster. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a shame that it turned out that way because I think if family dog was just this one-off thing as it originally was on amazing stories, mm -hmm. or even if it got that feature, I think it would have a much more, um, inter I think it would have a much more positive legacy. Well, I mean, I can imagine, and then here, you you know, then you've got Simpsons and Family Guy and all these more adult things and Adult Swim and all this stuff. It kind of, all that kind of more adult animation stuff started happening and everybody was watching it. Now. And even the Disney films and eventually the Pixar stuff, you know, you had people, young, we were always dreaming of animation having a big renaissance where everybody would accept animation more and they would take their dates on a Friday night, you know, and, and go mm -hmm. do, go see these movies. And eventually that is what exactly what happened, you know? Yeah. And, and so now I'm thinking, God, you know, if, if the timing had just been right and he had gotten a chance to do that movie the way he wanted, I'm certain it would have been a big hit because it was so different, you know, yeah. and, and uh, would have had a real impact. The same yeah, way if Brad, was, if Brad was helming it, it would have been amazing because Brad's a great director. Yeah, exactly. And and um, and he was just doing new stuff. New, it was covering new territory, you know, new territory with adult themes and you know, not not uh, X rated, but just stuff that that uh, was more sophisticated or stuff that adults could enjoy too. You know. Yeah. In a way, Family Dog does have an enduring legacy because have Brad having directed that, it kind of opened up a whole set of new careers for him. Well, so it I did, think that's... But, it, but I mean, he had a he had a uh, he had a pretty long rough spell after that, you know, because yeah. he was on a good trajectory with Steven Spielberg, and then the, because of that conflict, it, it 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 took him a long time to get his next shot, and then he. He went through long phases of being depressed about that and try, it was a struggle trying to get anything else going. And so he became a, a, a consultant on the, on the Simpsons, which was, you know, a, a huge success, obviously, but mm -hmm. it wasn't really uh, taking advantage of what he had to offer. You know, it was, mm -hmm. he was a good company and he was in, with, around all these brilliant people doing the Simpsons, but you know, and he they offered him to direct on that. And I was supposed to direct on the first season, too. Of the oh, Simpsons, that's interesting. Evidently. But I, I couldn't get out of my contract at Disney because I went back to Disney after Family Dog. And so that whole group of directors on The Simpsons, Rich Moore and, and uh, David Silverman. Wes Archer. Wes, all those guys. I was supposed to be part of that group and then I couldn't do it. But Brad wound up being a consultant on that. He was kind of just he was enjoying the Simpsons and he had a lot of respect for the writing and, and all that, but he didn't want to get involved with directing those because he was trying to get his own stuff going. Yeah. And, um, and it was just, you know, finally iron giant came along and 
he was kind of at a point like I got to do something here and he, he he turned that into what it was and that's a great movie too so yeah you know that was really his break but then that didn't do so good so he he thought oh my god I'm finished you know he, or I don't know if he felt completely like that but I know he wasn't happy with how how it was you know re, you know I think it was critically received well but the financially yeah uh, it was not a great success at the box office but I'm sure it was well received critically because oh it totally know, was and, every, and, and everybody in the animation community thought it was great so I mean, yeah but I remember when it was released I talked to him and he was he was on vacation he went off somewhere to just get away and he was really depressed about how you know it didn't do well and it was they hadn't marketed it properly and all that and he just yeah I think he was just scared because he thought oh man how how am I going to get another shot you know and then Pixar comes knocking at his door and the rest is history so yeah well thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me about family dog and i'd love to talk to you again sometime yeah sure anytime yeah Just thanks no and uh and uh, it was good chatting with you i hope i covered all your answers there yeah you definitely did thanks so much dan all right take care eli have a nice day all right take care